This is Charlie Myers. I'm the outdoor writer at the Denver Post newspaper. I'm here at the Denver International Sportsman's Expo show, 32nd annual event here in Denver. The show has visited us and it's a wonderful time. Here in the middle of winter, everybody gets very excited. I'm here with two of the true icons of American fly fishing. Lefty Cray on my right, Bob Clouser on my left. These gentlemen, well, they didn't invent fishing. I think that was uh, Isaac Walton or, or one of those guys, but it was close. And we have a history on all sides of me. It just, um, it, it flows from these fellows. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us today to sit down and talk about some of the old times, new times, uh, to get this and these, these wonderful people on film. I have on my right Lefty Cray, a man of few words, and that's because he's used them all up. <laughs> Lefty, I want to first ask you, uh, what, what have the real changes been in, um, in fly fishing since uh, uh, in, in your time? The most profound thing that happened was in 1965, three organizations were formed independent of each other that had a major effect, probably the most profound effect on fly fishing. In Eugene, Oregon, the Federation of Fly Fishing was organized. In uh, Michigan, Trout Unlimited was organized. And in New Jersey, the Saltwater Fly Riders of America. And all of these were organized independent of each other in the same year. And what happened was, before that, individuals just would maybe tell a friend how to fish. And there were a lot of fly fishermen. In fact, I lived in Maryland and I didn't know a single fly fisherman in central Maryland. And uh, what happened was they formed clubs, these organizations, the clubs began to share knowledge. So that was the major thing. The sick major thing was that there were almost no books on fly fishing back in the 60s. At the end of the 60s, we started getting an avalanche of these books out. And so we had lots of how-to. Then the VCRs came along and then the DVDs. So. It used to be that if you wanted to learn anything about fly casting, you had to learn it from somebody else. Now they had all sorts of information. The other thing that happened is just what we got here, uh, a lot of outdoor shows became good, and we had and fly fishing only shows, and we had people coming like we're here helping people with casting, explaining technique, fly tires, and that sort of thing. So, and now what's happening is we're getting more and more women involved in fly casting. In fact, I'm having some women now that actually are bringing their men to, to learn fly rather than be the other way around. Those were some of the major advancements. Of course, new reels, graphite, and that sort of thing off of bamboo. But the equipment is today is just incredible compared to equipment those days. Lefty Cray has been mostly associated with fly casting. You think of Lefty, you think of the guy who throws the fly line out of the room, and uh, it's been a, been a real forte. The other side of fly fishing is what are we going to catch them on? And the man who has been so instrumental in producing a line of flies, uh, it, it's been said that if, there, if there's a fish that swims and eats, um, you can catch them on a Bob Clouser fly. Bob, how did, how did you come to develop these flies? What was your theory behind it? Well, I got to tell you one thing here first, uh, and uh, I think it'll help you understand more. And I'm going to tell one of Lefty's stories. I've been married to the same lady for 52 years, and I've only been home half of them. So you know what my need came from. The other half, I was fishing all the time. So, and uh, Susquehanna River was one of my uh, favorite places because it took me about three minutes to get the boat in and go fishing every day, and it was full of smallmouth bass. And I could catch them on spinning and tackle and con all kinds of conventional tackle. And I just loved the fly rod. And my father bought me a fly rod and fly reel and a fly tying outfit for my 14th birthday. And I just was fascinated with putting all types of flies together. And I wanted to catch smallmouth bass on flies. I felt that I had to start with what they eat how the insects act and how the minnows acted when they chase, when the predator would chase them away. And I found out most conventional fly patterns were not ever heavy enough to go down to where the bass lived and where they fed. And just from using jigs, uh, bucktail streamer flies, and of course Lefty's Deceiver, one of them was one of my favorite flies at that time. 
uh, I decided just to add weight to the darn flies, and, and uh, we were putting split shot on them, and they were working good. And uh, Tom Schmucker from Wapsie Fly Company sent me and Lefty a set of lead eyes, barbell eyes, and I looked at them, and I just smiled from ear to ear. I just knew where they were going to go on a hook. And hey, after that, I give Lefty a handful, and he said, "Are these done?" <laughs> and, and, and I said, "You bet." And he he started the whole mess up, promoted all them flies for me, and that's just how it got going. Do a need. Bob Clouser, let me ask you another question. When did it occur to you that not only could you catch smallmouth bass and other warm water fish, but you could catch all these other things? And what did you do for to modify this fly to make it so effective? on all species of fish. Well, again, you know, I don't know why I give Lefty so much credit. He's the guy that caught all the doggone other species. He wouldn't take me along. <laughs> He's the one that took the dang fly and went all over the country and the world catching fish on this, and he called me at home, Bobby, that fly works on saltwater fish too. Well, thank you. I, you never took me along on any of the darn trips. <laughs> so, but anyhow, uh, he got it all around and we, with him and I working together, we designed it, little bigger fly, bigger hooks, heavier eyes, and my golly, now we got all types of rods that'll cast weight too. Yes. So the whole thing is involving into a quite an underwater sport. Charlie, the only thing I've ever kept a record on is Bob asked me how many keep a record on how many different species you've caught on the clouser. And uh, I remember one time, my first trip to New Guinea, I caught 20 different species that I never saw before. But uh, the last count, I think it was 86 species of fish I've caught on. So the thing, the thing will catch anything, really. Uh, that brings me to my next question, the thing I wonder about. Uh, there's just this explosion of different of flies with all of the contract tires and all of this. You go to, they go to fly display boxes and they can't build uh, <laughs> display boxes fast <laughs> enough to keep up with them. Where are we going with this? And Bob, I'll ask you that question, the, this development of flies. Well, you know, that's a hard question. I wish you wouldn't have really answered because I don't know where we're going with all this. And I think the biggest change in, in the fly tying realm of everything is the new synthetic materials. I, I think that that's going to add more patterns. Uh, it might not make them better, but it's going to make them easier to make uh, with all the uh, new synthetics are around. and. It's like anything else, if you're going to imitate a minnow and it gets, tries to get away from a predator, he's going to eat it regardless what's on that hook if, it, if it's working right. So I think the new synthetics are the actual new part of the whole fly tying route. Good. One thing I'd like to add to that is that in traveling around the world, whether it's New Zealand or it's trout fishing in England or whatever, you will find that the, mere, the real experienced guys that are catching lots of fish are usually only less probably than a dozen patterns of fly. It's far more how you present the fly than it is the fly. It doesn't have to have the underarm fur from orangutan from South Africa with, a, right. with Australian possum and something else <laughs> messed up in it. It's how you do that. A uh, classic example is I fish a lot with them hillbillies down there in North Carolina for years. They use one fly called a sheep fly, and it looks like a wet Adams. Adams. And that's the only fly they use, and they outfish everybody because they know how to present that thing. Exactly. Yeah. Bob, do you have any any more innovations you do you, what's in store for us from Bob Clouser surely you're going to you're going to have a wrinkle here somewhere uh, I have some stuff I'm not allowed to tell you <laughs> <laughs> but really it's going to be with some thin synthetics and actual uh, animal fibers mixed together in the flies uh, not much difference just using new tying techniques to make sure that the materials are used right in order to get the swimming motion of the flies. Thank you, Bob Clouser. Lefty, is there another deceiver in the no. out there anywhere? No, in fact, I get about one request a week from people to send me one of the receivers, and I've just gave up on it. I just yeah. don't tie anymore. Don't For tie myself, I did. Exactly. Amazing thing is, though, I don't have any idea how many I've catch, but I, I've used it all over the world in different shapes and sizes and lengths, and it's been a very, very yeah, effective very well. fly. What a wonderful occasion. It's such a delight for me to be here with Bob Clouser and Lefty Cray. Uh, American, American fly fishing history sitting here. Thank you, gentlemen. You bet.